Almost a year ago to this day, I bought a Flemish Giant, which is the second largest breed of rabbit in the world, in case you're curious. The first largest breed is the Continental Rabbit. And I named him Baxter, after the Baxter building in Fantastic Four. And we spent pretty much all day, every day together. At first, he was... He, was, he, he avoided me, he was scared. Most prey animals are. Rabbits aren't immediately affectionate, but once they trust you, they will follow you around, they are just your best friend. And we did get very close, and I have chronic fatigue syndrome, so I was home all day, every day. I'm basically housebound, and he would follow me from place to place. I record this on Tuesday. On Saturday, he died very suddenly. And so I went down to Margaret River for a week, and Baxter seemed fine when he got there. You're not eating as much, but you know, he's just a little unfamiliar with this environment, a little stressed, but eating, sleeping, doing all the stuff a rabbit normally does, grooming, pooping, <laughs> and everything was fine until we went to leave. And he started acting very strange. He was peeing on the carpet, not using his litter box, not eating. We immediately took him to a vet. And this is a vet in Margaret River, she wasn't a specialist in rabbits. She went, well, it doesn't look like he's dying, it's not a life or death situation yet, but I recommend as soon as you get back, take him to a vet. Which I did, next day. And he stayed there most of the day. I took him home at the end of the day because they said, well, it looks like he's on the mend, but he's still not eating, he, he might just be stressed because he's in an unfamiliar environment. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. And there's probably not much more that they can do there anyway, so I'll take him home, I'll keep feeding him. And he seemed to perk up a little bit when we took him home. He was looking around, moving, seemed pretty hopeful. But then he didn't move from his rug. I went to bed. He did not move from that spot. From the moment I went to bed to the moment I woke up, he was still there. So then I put him out in the garden. And that's his favorite spot. You know, we used to spend about an hour, two hours out there every day. The whole neighborhood knew us. We, we made a lot of friends. He was very well loved. And, and he always attracted so much attention. People, oh, that's such a big rabbit. Oh, he's so beautiful. He's so handsome. And so I thought, well, I'll put him out there. It might make him feel better. Or if he dies, he'll die in a place that he was happiest in and never wanted to come inside. In fact, sometimes they say rabbits only scream when it's life or death. No, not true. He would scream when he didn't want to come inside. <laughs> so I put him out there and he actually seemed to get better. He was looking around, he was sniffing, he was actually hopping around, moving around quite, you know, energetically. And then he lay down didn't move for a long time. He was insisting on lying in the sun and getting very hot. I kept moving him back into the shade. He would go out into the sun. He kept doing this back and forth. And so I was just watching him. I was reading. I was waiting for my brother, Jordan. I've mentioned Dylan in my last video. Jordan, my middle brother, middlest brother. Uh, yeah, I was waiting for him to show up. He slept through the first appointment, so I rescheduled with the vet, and I was waiting for him. And he was too late, because about 10 minutes before he showed up, Baxter went into convulsions. Only lasted maybe 15, 20 seconds. And then he died. I barely had enough time. So I was sitting just inside, looking at the glass, and saw him go into convulsions. By the time I got out there, I well, I think I might have been the last thing he ever saw. Because I got out there, I was standing over him, and then you just... You watch that spark, that light, that soul leave them. It is immediate. I don't... I mean, I've... Hey, I grew up with Live Lake. I've definitely seen people die on video, but when you're actually physically present with someone or something dying, that is something else altogether, and especially, you know, this is a face I, I wake up to, I look at every single day. And he suddenly changed. The moment he died, Baxter was gone. That I did not recognize the face of that rabbit. It was ugly. It was unfamiliar. It was, it was just nothing. And so my immediate 
response was to perform chest compressions. I know it is possible to do some first aid on, on small animals, rabbits and, and so on. I didn't think my chances were good and yeah, it, it was too late. I then carried him inside, immediately washed him off, prepared the body. I do plan on skinning him and, and keeping the fur. Not sure what I'll use it for just yet. Maybe make a little plushy version of Baxter. Maybe I'll just use the fur as on a, on a collar of a coat. But I think a lot of people will be horrified by that, the idea of, Oh, this was this was your baby boy. He was he was your child, and yes, he he was. I I loved him. We'll get into that. Can I experience love? I don't know, but I did care about him. I think, and this is actually a line from one of the Star Trek movies, which is probably written by Alice Kurtzman. Ill, but he has a point. There's a scene where oh, maybe I'll put it in here. Discuss this at all. That's what you're are, you, are you really going to do this right now? What never seems to require your undivided focus. Guys? I'm sorry, Captain. Just two seconds. Okay. Is us. At that volcano, you didn't give a thought to us. What it would do to me if you died, Spock. You didn't feel anything. You didn't care. And I'm not the only one who's upset with you. The Captain is too. Well, no, no, no. Don't drag me into this. She is right. Your suggestion that I do not care about dying is incorrect. A sentient being's optimal chance at maximizing their utility is a long and prosperous life. Great. Not exactly a love song, Spock. Nyota, you mistake my choice not to feel as a reflection of my not caring. While I assure you, the truth is precisely the opposite. But Spock says that caring and feeling are not the same thing. And when I heard that, that was such a revelation for me because I went, yes, that's what it's like for me. I don't think I'll ever know what love feels like, but I definitely know duty, loyalty, devotion. If anything, I would say that my version of love is far more unconditional and logical than someone with emotion where they, just, they might feel like, mm, I don't love you anymore. Maybe I want to be with someone else. I'm not going to do that. So, I didn't feel anything when Baxter died. I basically just accepted it as, this is happening, there is nothing I can do to change it. Well, I mean, I tried CPR, it didn't really work. Then I prepared the body, and my way of honoring him, I feel bad about just putting him in the ground and not utilizing his body in some way. I would actually would have liked to use his meat but uh, the, the rabbit meat farmers I've spoken to say, well, he was given medication about 12 hours before he died, and there could have been underlying issues other than the alias, so probably best never to eat a sick animal, so oh well. But uh, at least I'll get to keep a part of him and remember him that way. And my mother is absolutely horrified. She's been screeching at me not to do it, but I think we're just so divorced from where our food and our clothing and all of that comes from. And so to me, this is this feels right. It feels natural. You know, Baxter was a rabbit. He wasn't a human. It's not like I'm, you know, pulling an Ed Gein here and skinning my own mother. <laughs> so I think a normal person in my situation would be very upset to lose their rabbit after only having him for a year, you know, they can live up to 10 years, and I basically, and, and you probably would think, oh, I'd be so angry at my brother, I'd be th thinking, how could you? you, you, you killed my rabbit, you didn't get here on time, but I don't think that way either, I don't blame him, things happen. I basically, I'm a stoic by default, and I also really agree with this Buddhist philosophy of impermanence and before I even knew those philosophies as a child That's kind of what I was always leaning towards, but I just didn't have the language to articulate it and For a long time. I did think there was something wrong with me. I did worry I was maybe a psychopath, but no, I think I've got a very strong sense of morals of right and wrong. I have a very strict code of behavior so I guess when I started having dissociative episodes at the age of 23, I'm nearly 29 now, 
it's not surprising that the shape that took on was this delusion that I was an android or a robot or something like that. Not that kind of robot, but, you know, more like a, a you know, companion, servant, domestic, android. And that's actually the reason why I bought Baxter in the first place, is that I was about to move out of a share house. I moved into that share house specifically so I could have other people to serve, to be a part of a community. I go into more about this in my first video and probably will do an one specifically focusing on my Android delusion. But I bought Baxter because I wanted someone or something to serve as I went into my studio apartment and lived by myself for the first time. And he he fulfilled that role very well. He's he was demanding, he wasn't too demanding. It was it was the perfect relationship, I think. And I did often think about it that do I love this thing? Do I feel anything for it? And yeah, especially towards the end, I, I did very much care about Baxter. But I don't know if I could ever actually feel love. I, well, I recently filled out a color wheel. They do an emotion color wheel, I'll put that up here. And I have just filled it out to see what emotions do I actually feel or think I feel. And it was a huge bias towards positive emotions. You know, I can be happy, I can be excited, I can be passionate, I can be, you know, I can be a good friend. I can have those kind of connections with people. But, emotional pain. Do I get embarrassed? Do I get angry? Do I feel jealous? Do I feel afraid? Do I... None of those things. And, frankly, it is quite an advantage. So I've basically been spending the last three decades nearly trying to figure out how I function and why I'm different from other people because I think there's so many conditions that people go through life not knowing they have and not understanding why other people aren't like them or they don't realize just how different they are because they assume their perspective is the default. Say for example, a musica. A musica is a condition where people cannot interpret music as music. They don't understand rhythm. There's, there's no emotional response to it. And I see people like that online all the time asking the question. They have no idea. They're just like, music is terrible. Why do people like music? I don't get it. <laughs> They've gone years without knowing. So, congenital analgesia is a condition where people cannot feel physical pain. And I think that is quite a good metaphor for my own experience. Someone with this condition isn't invincible. They can break bones. And if you've broken your leg, you can't walk. You can't support your weight. You may get blood poisoning. You might get an infection. You might die. And, in my case, can't feel emotional pain. Don't get those early warning signs. But I can, turns out, have mental health problems, which I'm learning the hard way. It's why I thought I was transgender. I now realize I probably have depersonalization disorder, I have a delusion that I am an android, so now I'm having to live with that and trying to work it all out. And I'll probably, I'll definitely have to do a video where I just focus specifically on thinking I'm an android and why I can't just tell myself, don't think that? Can you just stop? No, it turns out you can't. That's not how delusions work. And you're probably hoping that I'm going to say to you feeling people, you feelers, that, oh no, it is you who have the best experience. No, actually, this is pretty great. Not gonna lie. I have a lot of advantages. When I was a child, I was pretty normal. And I guess most of these stories will start going back to childhood to figure out where exactly did everything go wrong. But I, I kind of knew I was a little different in terms of emotions because, and I mentioned this in my first video, that... You know, I'd get into fights or I'd do something bad and the teachers or my parents would say, well, how would you feel if someone did that to you? And I'd just go, I wouldn't feel anything. Why is it a problem? Why is everyone freaking out? It didn't really occur to me just how real emotions are. And that's made some people very angry before because I thought I can sort of pretend to have emotions. I can vicariously get into an emotional state. So... Uh, when I watch movies, when I listen to music, when I write stories and I'm acting them out and I can I can even fake cry, I can very much get into the frame of mind of those characters. 
but it's not real. I, I have no idea what it's like to really feel upset. Whereas when I'm emotional, I've worked myself up into a scene, it's just like, oh, this is fun, so different and dramatic. But yeah, no, it's, it's not real. I can just turn it off and I'm not really bothered by it. So when I was 11, and I do have to do a separate video on this, I developed symptoms of autism. I don't know if I actually had autism. We don't really know anything about autism, you know? Is it just one thing that you have to be born with? You have to follow these very exact standards of diagnosis, you know, that you start developing symptoms around two or three months of age, so on and so forth. Or is it a cluster of symptoms that occur under different circumstances? You know, like chronic fatigue syndrome isn't caused by one disease. Chronic fatigue syndrome is the result of various diseases. It is an autoimmune problem. So in that sense, I would argue that autism might be the same thing. It certainly was in my case. I had a bout of gastro and I suddenly, my personality totally changed and I was anxious, but in an autism overstimulated kind of way. Like I didn't really have emotions, but my body suddenly started having all this stress and this anxiety. So, you know, I, I have a human body. I definitely have those responses. Also, my favorite response when I tell people that I've cured my autism by uh, going on the carnivore diet. So yes, I went carnivore uh, about two or three years ago. And yeah, all my autism symptoms went away, which made me start to think, well, was I ever autistic in the first place? So, I'm trying to keep this all, there's so many details, I'm sorry, there's just a lot to keep track. But my favorite response on Reddit when I mentioned the carnivore diet even got rid of these symptoms for me. It's like, well, I never knew someone who shit themselves so hard they gave themselves autism. That's hilarious. Thank you, sir or madam. I will keep that with you. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, yeah. I'm not offended at all, because I know, I know I am a very unusual case for everything. I'm not expecting people to understand it except me at all. So I believe having autism, autism symptoms of some description has in some way affected my emotional development. That seems to make sense. I did have some emotions as a child, but I think that's just normal for every child that they are more in touch with their instincts, there's less of a filter, they just, whatever they're thinking, it comes out. Whatever they're feeling, it happens. So I investigated conditions that I might have, you know, why don't I have emotions? I just thought, oh, well, I'm autistic, and that's why I don't have feelings. And then I met other autistic people, and I, you know, did all my research, and turns out, oh, actually, autistic people feel a lot, but they have a lot of trouble expressing themselves, and I went, that's not me. No, I'm just a robot. I don't feel anything. Then I found out about alexithymia. Alexithymia is a condition where people are just absolutely unable to connect to their own feelings. They are having emotions, but they don't recognize them. Okay, maybe that is me. Did more research. No, that's not me at all. Especially one of the symptoms is that they don't have imagination. Oh, oh, no, 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 I have hyperphantasia. If anything, I have too much imagination, that's kind of a problem. Should do a separate video on hyperphantasia at some point. Wowee, I'm weird. Got a lot of stuff going on. Anyway, then I discovered the book How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett, and it changed my life. This woman, she has faced a fair amount of backlash because, and I have too, People are very attached to their emotions. If you tell them that their emotions are simply a biological mechanism, that their feelings aren't truly real, oh my god, they freak out. Someone came up to her after a TED talk and said, oh, some tragedy befell her. Oh, my husband died. And you're telling me my pain isn't real. No, she didn't say that. I once had some random dude, wasn't even talking to him or about him, he was just like, how dare you say emotions are fun? My wife had a miscarriage. And not seeing a connection here. Uh, yeah, if anything, that guy was kind of ableist because he couldn't see my perspective that I didn't mean any offense anyway. But 
that's that's another issue that I do have to really closely monitor my actions and have to have a very rigid sense of morals so that I can know I am behaving correctly. I don't have emotions to make me feel like, well, to have empathy, to feel like, oh man, I feel bad for this person or I feel like I've done the wrong thing. I basically just have to do the best I can, be as tolerant and understanding and, well, actually, you know, Optimus Prime has uh, been an inspiration in that. I, growing up, but even even now, um, there's a quote, the voice actor who, who voices uh, Optimus, Peter Cullen, his brother actually said this, kind of inspired Optimus, he said, be strong enough to be gentle. And I think about that a lot. You know, I never want to snap at someone or dismiss them or raise my voice unless it's absolutely necessary. I want to talk to you, I want to understand, I want to be as patient and forgiving as possible. And I think for people with emotions that's very difficult, but for me it's really the only way I could operate because and I've had, you know, friends and family members just go, why did you not tell that person to fuck off? You had every, they were abusing you, they were mistreating you, they were being awful, no, no, no. And I just can't do it because I don't feel like it could ever be justified because I don't ever feel that way. I mean, sometimes I've had to kind of get a little aggressive, get a little nasty because someone's just not getting the message and I do have to defend myself, but for the most part, I try to be as best as I can, as prime as I can. And honestly, from my perspective, I feel like people with emotions are the scary ones. You know, I'm not a psychopath. They're the psychopaths. They could just snap at any moment and just decide they're so enraged or jealous or whatever that they want to take an axe to your neck. But returning to Lisa Barrett and how emotions are made, her book was eye-opening to me because it broke down the interoceptive senses. So, when you're born, you don't have those nuances of knowing specific emotions. It's not like Inside Out. Ins I hate Inside Out. I have a lot of problems with that movie. That is not how emotions are made. That's specifically not how my emotions are made. I felt very excluded. How dare you, Pixar? So how emotions really work. The interoceptive senses, if you will. You have comfortable, uncomfortable, excited and calm. They also say aroused sometimes, but you know, I'm immature, so that makes me laugh. And once that was laid out for me, I went, oh, oh, I get it now. Because I would often say, oh, I don't have emotions, but then I would feel something physically and think, so what was that? Was that an emotion? Was it gas? Who can say? So. That's what's happening. I have a physical body. Physical, human body. I need to remind myself that. Human. I am a human. Human. Mm. Not a robot. But I realize that I have the autonomic responses. I have the fight or flight response. My heart can race. I can have all those physical, you know, di people's dilating, sweating. Yeah, I can do that. But actually having real deep emotions that last. I have no idea what that's like. For the most part, I'm very Zen, very stoic. And that's probably why I do gravitate towards stoicism and Buddhism and I enjoy meditation and stuff because it's basically how my brain always is. Um, meditation, primarily for me, how I benefit is, it's how I manage my hyperphantasia in the sense that, which is an overactive imagination to the point that I'm basically, I got bit VR. I close my eyes, I'm in VR. Meditation helps me manage that because I can either delve into those imaginary worlds in this shamanic journey, if you will, or I can just help my brain go totally blank. Because so I think that's my one problem. Although I'm quite mindful and present at all times, the imagination, you know, might take me a million miles away. So, that's really all, I, you know, I've never really needed to meditate because I'm stressed. I can be, I can be physically stressed. There's definitely times I go, I am exhausted, I've been pushed to my limit, I've, I'm just working too hard. 
uh, yeah, people could annoy me. I can definitely get annoyed and frustrated. I definitely know those feelings. And, well, yeah, I mean, I saw that on the, uh, the color wheel chart that I went, okay, so I have those minor, like, lower, what I call primary colors of emotions. And then you got the secondary and the tertiary. I don't have those other ones. I don't know those really sophisticated emotions. It's just happy, calm, confused. I basically have those three. There's been a lot of situations where not having emotions or having no ability to feel emotional pain has been very advantageous. So when I was about 18 or 19, woke up one morning and my dad was having a heart attack. I mean, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was moaning, he was vomiting, he was really, I've never seen him that sick. And I had just done a first aid course, so I was kind of just trying to figure out, okay, so what do we do, what, what's wrong? I actually didn't figure out it was a heart attack, my mother did. But I was just able to keep calm. I was, mostly I was just so tired and not able to think straight, so I wasn't good to anybody. And more recently, I, I live on an intersection and there was this massive car accident. Just after I'd switched out the lights, I was staying up late, I was writing, it was about 1 or 2 a.m. And I was in the dark and I heard this ungodly noise, just this screeching, this crushing of metal. I was imagining something, I mean, I could eat it, the way it sounded, it sounded like something was coming towards me, you know, I'm, I lie in bed right here, the window's right there, intersection on the other side of it, and I thought, what do I do? Is this my last thought? Am I gonna die? Is a car gonna come flying through this wall? And, you know, Baxter woke up too, he skidded away from that wall, because he used to sleep under the desk here. And, again, because I just, why do all the dramatic things happen when I've either just gone to bed or when I just wake up? Good lord. Come on, get me when I've got a full face of makeup on. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's go. No. Instead, it's always, always when I'm in, pajama, in my pajamas, I walk out there, I have a t-shirt saying, I'm not Daredevil. <laughs> and uh, I, I look out there and all my neighbours have run out there already. I don't know, I have no concept of time. I'd just woken up. I was very out of it. I just opened the door, I'm just like, has anyone called triple zero? No? Okay. Get on the phone. And I'm very polite <laughs> and having a little bit of a chat with the, the woman on the emergency services line. And yeah, we I just run through the whole thing. Very matter of fact. And I, I was shivering, but it was because it was cold. You know, I was in my pajamas, I was just wearing a t-shirt and shorts and... It, it was very cold out there. I just could not get warm to the point that I could barely talk. My teeth were just stuck together. And a lot of people thought, oh, is it because you were frightened? You know, you were in this high adrenaline state. You know what? Sometimes I do get adrenaline going. Not that night. I was very calm. It was just... I almost feel like I am having fewer and fewer emotions as time goes on. Uh, you know, in the past few years, because of my radical... Personality changes, you know, not being trans anymore, not being autistic anymore, and making friends who very much b valued m me on those social identities. You know, the people who rejected me based purely on that. You know, these were my friends. I was very close to them, and they rejected me, and I... Yeah, kind of, when we were having those arguments, there was a bit of that adrenaline going, Oh, oh, shit, what's going on? Oh, you know, you, my body's going on high alert. More recently, having conflicts like that, I'm just going, hmm, okay. If you don't want me to be your friend anymore, okay, but I'll still be here if you ever want to come back. You absolute lunatic. <laughs> but you, you feel this, man. You make things so dramatic. Everything that happens in my life, it's almost just like watching a TV show. Like, it can be exciting, I can be invested. You know, I'm definitely, I'm very lucky I'm not someone who is numb, who doesn't feel anything, who is just indifferent. You know, I think that would be the worst. Whereas, no, I can definitely, I have a lot of fun, I'm excited, I enjoy my life, even though I've gone through a lot of hardships and a lot of pain, those things just make me stronger and make me more mature and make me more grounded and overall a better person. And, you know, they make my story more interesting, right? you got to have a bit of character conflict. That said, I can't feel some forms of pleasure. I definitely have a lot of intellectual pleasure. I 
take a lot of satisfaction in being productive and creative and serving a function within my community, within my family, within my social circle. And that's why I love making podcasts or costumes, writing stories, fan fiction, drawing, whatever it is, you know, these are things that other people get enjoyment out of and it gives me a sense of purpose and value. But I can't experience physical pleasure. I, I am asexual and I am wondering if that's somewhat related to not having emotions or having a limited emotional experience. I mean, I've already said, most of it is I can't feel pain, but then I can't feel love. I didn't realize trust was an emotion until I read an interview. It was on SBS. I'll see if I can find, uh, find it and put it in the description. But this is a woman who was a psychopath, but she wasn't like a serial killer or anything. But I related to her experience so much. And she said, I didn't realize trust was an emotion until someone explained it to me. And I went, wait, hold up. It is? Oh, okay. That, uh, uh, I understand now. Because I don't know what trust is. I make an evaluation based on a person's history, you know, their, their, their personality type, their past behaviours, how trustworthy is a person. And, I mean, it depends on what we mean specifically by trustworthy. Are they capable of getting your groceries and not screwing that up? Are they capable of getting, to you, an, getting you to an appointment on time? So on and so forth. Everyone is trustworthy in different ways. I would trust some friends to do some things that I wouldn't trust other friends to do, but I trust all of them fundamentally. So, yes, you know, not having these emotions, I am very productive, I never get bored, I never, I'm never afraid, I never feel like, oh, I can't do it, or I, I won't do well enough. You know, when I record these videos, I don't, I've got some notes here, but otherwise, I don't know, I'm just making this up as I go along. I, I trust myself and I have enough confidence in myself that I know how to tell a cohesive story because, well, I've been doing solo podcasts for three years almost. I should know what I'm doing. And I get a lot of feedback, so there's that. But going back to physical pleasure, I don't enjoy eating, although I take a lot of pride in cooking and researching nutrition and proper, properly feeding my body in a way that makes me as healthy as I possibly can be. And... I also enjoy the presentation of food. I now enjoy the artistry of it. I think for a long time I just sort of went, it's just food, you know, you just shove it in your mouth, why do you care? But I think everything should be treated with a sense of pride and they can be something enjoyable about every experience. Not having emotions also played a huge factor in me thinking I was transgender. I went to the doctors saying I don't feel right in my body. It turns out I was dissociating. And I had this delusion that I was a, an android, specifically a male android. And I didn't mention that, of course, that's crazy. Why would you tell a doctor that you think you're a robot? Anyway, so they thought I was trans and I didn't have the emotions to tell me, maybe this isn't right for me. I mean, eventually I woke up and figured it out, but yeah, I, I think maybe I could have avoided this situation if I actually had a better sense of myself and my own feelings, if I had any. The biggest issue is that I always feel like I'm pretending. You know, being female right now and when I was being male, it was all performance. It was all, these are the mannerisms, the hand gestures, the posture, the makeup, the hair, everything. This is how you must present if you want to be male. This is how you must present if you want to be female. You know, everything was conscious. My word choices, I tend to be, well, I used to talk very fast as a kid. But nowadays I tend to be much slower at the way I speak because it is very considered. And that's what I'm like with everything. I call it superliminal action. You know, you have subliminal action. Most people move around, you know, interact with their environment, talk, whatever, subliminally. You're not consciously, for the most part, you aren't really thinking that much about it. I am, so I'm very good at mindfulness. <laughs> But that led me to not know who I was because, you know, when you're in that super mindful state all the time where everything's impermanent, there is, uh, there is the concept of a nutta in Buddhism where uh, there is no real sense of you. You are an ever-changing thing. But when you think that all the time, it can be an issue. 
You know, it's fine when you're in a meditation session and you just let go of your identity. But if you don't have a sense of identity ever, that's a problem. I, I think I do have a sense of my identity, you know, the way I speak, the energy I would bring to an interaction, that sort of stuff, how I would behave in a particular situation. I know that because I've carefully constructed that personality. Was that always the case? Well, going back and listening to myself or watching myself while I was autistic, no. I think I was very much beholden to the quirks and ticks and limitations of that condition. It was actually quite shocking to me to see I had quite a stilted way of speaking. I didn't have a lot of, you know, like uh, diaphragm and, and vocal control, breath control. You know, a lot of that changes with age and maturity, but yeah, it was just amazing to go, wow, it's this one condition changed the way I thought, changed the way I interacted with the world. So it doesn't really help the issue of feeling like I don't have a solid identity and my personality is constantly changing. I think everyone's changing to a degree, but I took that to a new extreme. This has been a very difficult experience to grow up with because I needed a lot of guidance, but no one around me could provide it. You know, I was raised as an ordinary human child with feelings. And that was absolutely the worst thing to do because I became misanthropic and sociopathic and indifferent. You know, I, I thought I didn't care. I just, I, I didn't have a way to consciously harness a sense of compassion. I might not have empathy, but I have compassion. I'm a very compassionate person. And I, yeah, I think I was being raised wrong and that had some dire consequences. I was aggressive, I was violent, I, I was not a good kid. I was just very lost and confused. And it was through fiction that I was able to make sense of myself. So robots in fiction definitely helped a lot. Data in Star Trek, for example. And also aliens, like Spock. Vulcans, you know, I really relate to them and I think they do get mishandled a lot in stories, but I admire their culture and I think there is something very noble and, and wonderful about their society. It's, it's very respectable. I would love to move to Vulcan. And it was through them that I was better able to understand myself and create my own moral subroutine, ethical protocols, if you will. And so when I had constructed such a logical and strict moral code, and just a, my, that's my way of thinking in general, I have a very structured way of thinking. When I had done that, and then I started having those dissociative episodes, yeah, again, looking back, it's kind of obvious why I landed on robot, not alien, or other kin, you know, I'm not a wolf or something. So I guess that makes sense. There's probably a lot more to talk about, you know, this is my everyday experience, so I kind of take it for granted. But if you have questions, I will be glad to respond to them in the comment section, and I can do other videos in the future. But I will leave you with a quote that means a lot to me. It's from Isabella from Discworld. She's the adoptive daughter of Death, the anthropomorphic personification of Death, if you will, the Grim Reaper. And she says... He didn't feel sorry for me. He never feels anything. He probably thought sorry for me. And I love that. He thought sorry for me. I, I use that a lot, actually, that, well, I thought love, and I thought regret. And I think that's a really helpful way for me to express myself, because human language was not designed for me, but I'm finding ways around it. Oh, one final thing. And I do think I should make this a recurring thing. Uh, in the first episode, I had my, my subtle Megatron-inspired makeup look. I think this is my ratchet look, you know? It's, uh, I've never bought anything orange before. I've never worn orange, but I'm kind of digging it. Oh, and uh, here's the rest of the outfit. These shoes. Hell yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, next time. I've got to dress as Optimus Prime, I guess. I, got to, I don't know how we're going to... Do I even own anything red? I don't know. Why, why did I ever think that I was male, honestly, you know? I clearly love makeup and getting dressed up and doing all of that a lot, you know, all the, all the costume and... Wow, again, not having emotions. Can't make sense of myself.
Oh, and see you, Space Cowboy.